Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the Naval War College, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So our wargaming theme continues today, and we're here to learn about one of the most challenging topics to effectively wargame, which is cyber operations. To help us better understand how we can game the realms of cyber and warfare together, get them to work with each other, we're excited to welcome two faculty members from the Naval War College. Our first guest is Professor Benjamin Schechter, who is an instructor in the Strategic and Operational Research Department and a founding faculty member of the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute. His research interests include cyber, wargaming, and political psychology. His recent work is focused on experimental wargaming and methods for cyber wargaming. Prior to joining the U.S. Naval War College, he was a research specialist supporting the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Our second guest is Dr. Nina Collars, who first and foremost, at least in our book, is one of our Kulak Center non-resident fellows. Dr. Collars is an associate professor in the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute. She holds a PhD from The Ohio State University in Political Science and an MA from George Washington, uh, yeah, George Washington University in International Relations. Along with being one of our non-resident fellows, Dr. Collars is also a senior adjunct scholar at Center for New American Security, an executive board member of the Cyber Conflict Studies Association, and an editorial board member for the Texas National Security Review. She publishes on cybersecurity, hackers, and military innovation. She presented her own hacker project at DEF CON 27 called Confessions of a Nespresso Money Mule. She will soon publish Trustworthy Deviants, White Hat Hackers, and Security. So Dr. Collars, Professor Schechter, welcome, or thank you for joining us. Welcome, and I will turn it over to you too. Well, thank you for having us. It's exciting to be here today. Um, uh, first off, I'd say we're coming to you live from a colleague's house um, as we uh, coordinate places that are both have AC and good internet. Um, truly, we're living the the hacker lifestyle, right? That's now. right. That's right. So it turns out that the um, that the air conditioning is out in our main buildings, and so uh, currently I'm domiciled in Washington D.C. doing work down there. Um, ben and I are both doing a cyber study. And he's up here, but we figured um, we would just broadcast out of our friend Amanda's place. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, and so if you look behind us, you'll see Amanda is part of a of, of a sort of a small cohort of folks up here at the Naval War College. Not everybody does war gaming, um, but everybody I think here likes to play games. And so, just as a working example, these are sort of the normal. These aren't really academic books, but anyway. But but then back here is just a bunch of games, and so one of the things that we always invite people to do when they come up here is to sort of sit down and play a game with us, see if you have some time. And so you all are anytime you want to come on up, and we're happy to give you a look around the college, um, play a couple games. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's nice when you love what you do. So I think today, and you will we'll sort of hash this out as we go um, in this sort of uh, vein of cyber and war gaming. Uh, and this sort of emerging space, we're going to, I think, depend a fair bit on questions from the public as we sort of uh, talk through this problem set. But I think we have a few things that we want to make sure we uh, uh, we cover. I think first is the myth of what are cyber war games. Um, I think is a big one. Uh, I think the other is what makes it hard because everyone talks about it. it's it's so hard, it's so terrible, it's so challenging, um, and that's absolutely true. And you should only go to specialists like us if you ever have a cyber war gaming problem. Uh, uh, do not try to do it at home, um, but actually you should try to do it at home. That's the whole point. Uh, and then finally, we have some great stories about how and why we got into this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can tell the origin stories first. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. Okay. We'll start with the origin stories and sort of like how, you know, how is it the case? Cause so, so, um, for those of you who are new to kind of thinking about cyber stuff and then war gaming in addition, you know, what you should know is that like thinking about cyber as an academic or even just sort of an analytical query um, is, is newish, right? Compared to the way we think about, I don't know, war, war fighting um, navies, right? So, so because it's newish, nobody has a monopoly on it. And so we say over and over again, like if you're at all interested in joining the space, thinking about cyber wargaming, 
you know, you're not that far behind. Everybody has just started thinking about this space. And so really the question you have to ask yourself is what expertise do I bring to this space? What, what, what contribution, what angle um, do I want to come at this at? So how did you get started? Yeah, so I think that uh, what's interesting about this also is that, like, as you sort of mentioned, one of the monopoly on this uh, is that, um, unlike traditional war fighting, right, states tend to do the war fighting for the most part, um, or non-state actors, but cyber really is sort of a pretty democratized phenomenon. Corporations, individuals would all related to this. Um, so I came to the cyberspace through actually, like many of the uh, post 9-11 generation through counterterrorism and cyber terrorism, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, and looking at sort of how it was used for logistical purposes. Um, but more recently, I've come through it to return to it actually through war gaming, right? I did some work on it, but really the, the return to true cyber was, uh, was how to war game cyber to explore these cyber questions. Right? Um, and so uh, in between those terrorism days and the war gaming days, I was at DARPA, which was fun and fine. Um, but- Did you do any cyber stuff there? So, at, at DARPA, I did do a lot of cyber stuff. They had a lot of AI projects going on that were very interesting and very exciting. But the churn there was so fast that developing any sort of expert, I don't say expertise, but even competence on any particular issue was was challenging, right? Which I think captures, I think, the reality of the space, right? That the churn is real. Uh, and anyone who, who claims or is an expert can quickly become dated. And similarly, anyone who doesn't think of themselves as an expert can become one. So anyway, I got to the War College, did some cyber war gaming to do research things, uh, and that sort of brings us to uh, to today. Or an origin story, Marvel would not make a comic about that. Just really missing out. How about you? How did you? How did you come to cyber? So I so um, so I, so I started out um, academically um, as a as a military innovation scholar. So, so specifically, mostly actually what's called a military adaptation scholar. So in a subset, there's a big umbrella called military innovation. And then within it, we think about how do militaries change both organizationally and technologically. And so um, I was the, I was from an ilk of people who said, okay, look, you roll into a conflict and there's no way to perfectly anticipate. This is actually fully in line with the Marine Corps ethos, by the way. So there's no way to perfectly anticipate what's going to happen. So what do you do? You have to learn how to adapt, right? And so the question is like, what do you do when you get to your battle space and you've got technology doesn't quite fit and you've got uh, people who don't quite know how to do the job, you, you adapt. And so, um, so then my, my uh, dissertation work was on technological adaptation in Vietnam um, for the army. And so, um, and I later did a piece on amphibs and some work for special operations command. So I, just, I tried to sort of round the circle out a little bit. Um, but once I finished that work, I started thinking about, um, okay, well, what else is there that's highly adaptive and dynamic? And, you know, what can I, what can I look at that's emerging that we can think about at adaptive capacity or thinking about how to sort of pivot better. And so the challenge just generically was cyber. So not even thinking about it in terms of how do militaries do it, but just, you know, who's doing it now, right? And how do they do what they do? And so the time I started asking that question was about four or five years ago, I started asking the question like, okay, well, who's doing cyber offense and defense now on the regular? And, 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 and then how do I get there and study it just so I can see how they're doing it? And it turns out, right, so hackers are the ones who do offense and defense on the regular, then it's not highly classified, right? Your trick is how do you, find them and then how do you get them to talk to you so that's how i started working in cyber that's that's sort of i guess if my brand if there's such a thing um i do a lot of bottom-up research so i do work on so I sort of find people who do work and ask them how they do it so and then the gaming component is different so like you're more of a natural gamer um this is more your environment um i i started gaming because i was i was a college professor and i thought that that was a brilliant way to teach my students um how to explore a space that didn't involve lecturing at them all the time and it gave them opportunities to express their creativity so so when i came to the naval war college it was this sort of just intersection of okay look i do do games all the time um but that's a teaching method and then um and then i here i was doing this project on 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 cyber stuff chasing hackers around so that's how that worked yeah, yeah. that's my origin story it's much cooler there's hackers there's military adaptation some of special forces I would I'd definitely make a, a movie about that. And you sound like you're well positioned to become a PME professor as well, teaching wargaming and 
I was an accident. Right. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to be a PME instructor. So that's, that was a whole other story, but, um, okay. So origin stories aside, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What do you, okay. So what, what's, what do you mean? What did you mean by the myth, the myth about cyber? What you mean? Yeah. Okay. So the, we talked about so cyber war gaming, quote unquote, right. Um, as we've sort of done research, we're producing a sort of netted volume. And there's a lot of work that's gone into this. There is a large question about what is cyber war gaming and as academics and in a military space, right? Definitions are, are big. People love to put definitions on, on things. Uh, and this has become hard because in this environment, we like to think about cyberspace as a sort of war fighting domain, uh, which means that we like to think about it in sort of those military terms, right? It's a space in which you generate effects or however, whatever the current terminology you want to use is. Um, but the challenge there is that we sort of alluded to in the front end, the democratized space, right? Um, and so we talked about as a war fighting domain. Well, you know, Citibank is going to think about it as a as a practical business environment, right? right. Um, and moreover, the average person is going to think about it as if they do it all, right? As an enabler for their smartphone, for gaming, uh, or going to super exciting WebEx talks. Um, and so we get into this challenge of what people consider to be cyber and to be this is challenging, which means what is it that you're gaming? Mm -hmm. And and this is before you even get into the question of like the different types of war game. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as we, we discuss this uh, this set, there's sort of two sets of questions, right? Um, who who are we trying to answer questions for? Who are we war gaming for? Uh, and then how do we get everyone to on the same page of in this instance, what is the definition of cyber we're using so that we can achieve whatever the war game objectives are, right? The last thing you want to say with war gaming is have people fighting the scenario the whole time. We don't want a um, actually conversation every time we do, we do war gaming. So I don't know if you want to segue into some sense making conversations or, or, or. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, it, I think, I think if the audience has questions about how to design war games uh, for cyber better, um, we can move into that space. I, 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 cause there's, because if you've ever talked to us, if you've ever talked to a war gamer, the answer is always it depends. And so, so it's yeah. potentially easier if you say sort of if you if you tell us what you're trying to get at, then we can sort of talk to you about how to get there. Um, but I wanted to just pull the thread a little bit further. Sorry for the background noise, but I wanted to pull the thread a little bit further on kind of why we say there's so many ways to do cyber war gaming. And, and if we, even if we scope it specifically to, okay, let's just talk pure military operations. Let's just, right. let's just go straight, you know, let's, you know, leave behind all this crap about, you know, financial sector and cooperation and whatever, it's boring. So, okay, so let's talk, let's talk full on like mill ops, right? You're gonna, you're gonna take the port, right? Um, oh, cool, 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 okay. Um, so, even then, it you like there's no way to kind of to kind of wash off the everybody is in this game problem. And so, good case in point is like we so Ben and I the Adventures of Nina and Ben. Ben and I were down in uh, where were we Argentina? Argentina. We were in Argentina, and we were uh, running some kind of game. But anyway, so we still so we step outside in the beautiful uh, city of Buenos Aires, and there we we look down the thoroughfare, and there are these blinking lights on top of every one of the light fixtures along these pedestrian walkways that were then connected to these boxes uh, that in turn had so a lot of just blinking lights, right, um, on, on things. Right, yeah. Um, so our internal hackers say, okay, well, let's go check those out and see what's going on, right? Because it's everywhere around the city. And it turns out they're, they're Wi-Fi repeaters and consoles. Cool, that's great. Super great. Buenos Aires is a, is a wired, smart, yep, wired smart city. So, which is awesome until you look a little more closer at the consoles. And as it turns out, we just dug around a little bit and figuring out like what they did and what they're connected to and who produced them and who was the primary developer of this technology. Um, and without putting too fine a point on it, it just maybe wasn't some, an actor we were super excited was <laughs> managing all of the functional data for a major metropolitan area. Um, Especially when you start thinking about what this might mean for transportation infrastructure that might have relevance for you know, airports, ports, uh, things like that, which obviously, you know, DOD has no interest in those types of things, he said sarcastically. 
Um, yeah. And and yeah. so yeah. No, no. These I mean, entire smart cities are being funded by countries, maybe not necessarily. Um, don't see the world the same way the United States does, right? And so one should assume in a in a conflict situation, what would you do, right? If you held the keys and all the data and all the access and all the maintenance capabilities to a smart city and an adversary are operating in that space, you would want to think about that, right? You would want to try and figure out, you know, what what does this mean for degrades and I, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's so you can't you can't get away from the rest of the world by saying no 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 we're just talking about military operations right so the conditions under which we would anticipate pure military on military only cyber operations I I can't I can think of so few instances we we like to talk about that right now especially as we do these things about persistent engagement mm -hmm. and, and then mm -hmm. forward right which does seem very like it's us and them in the cyber domain duped it out uh, um and i think that that might seem very nice to the status quo it also excludes cyber exploitations or espionage uh, which is its own game uh but moreover it it doesn't capture how it would probably look right at a high intensity Especially in a world where we were so concerned about sensors and sort of, well, we'll say with sensors and other things that gather and, and collect data, um, it's it's a it's a challenging, challenging problem. Well, it's more than challenging. So we so Ben and I are actually um, we are for better or for worse um, going forward. So there's a there's a competition for those of you out there who know who Andy Marshall is. The Andrew, you just remembering this now? Yes. We Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Um, because we, it's a competition. We have to write this paper eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's uh, put it this way: it's a space ripe for further exploration. That's right. I think That's is, right. Is, so it's really right. So I'm just thinking about all the ways in which the private sector overlap different uh, infrastructures. The way those the way those all come. This is all unclass research, right? right? So private sector private sector infrastructure, especially those that are global. And then what does that mean for conflict, right? Yeah. So we're accustomed to, particularly military, is accustomed to thinking of military on military conflict. And so what does it mean that um, you're going to be leveraging cyber degrade, dis right. deny, disrupt? Um, and if you can't reach the adversaries C2, what it, which C2s are you going to hit, right? So that's a, it's an interesting question, and we just right. we just want to pull the thread on that. And, and so right. hopefully forthcoming work, you know, yeah. provided we run out of which sort of hits on the first point of military cyber wargaming or cyber wargaming in general, which is it's never just military. Um, you can artificially constrain it in some ways, right? Um, but then that is you will, that is a major assumption you're making and I constrain the cyberspace in the game because private sector is such a fundamental aspect of this space. So um, it's almost unavoidable. I think that's lesson number one, the temporal spatial aspects of cyber wargaming, to use the technical term, are terrible. Um, it involves a, a, a lot of artificiality that needs to be explicitly stated to players. Um, so otherwise, they will attempt to. And I apply, you know, players want to break everything. They will always try to reach back and attack things in cyberspace outside of that theater. Sure. That question. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. And it's actually fun because you get some see some really weird and wonderful ideas uh, that the game is not prepared to handle. Yeah, that's yeah, you're right. That is that's one of the problems is keeping your players constrained to the game that you that you want them to play to sort of demonstrate the effects you want to. So I think so I wonder if we let's anything else you wanna so anything else that you wanna say in terms of the hard what's hard and then how do you what's hard about cyber besides the fact that there's no clear forward line of operations, there's no clear right, right. there's no clear delineation between adversary and private sector, what yeah. are, what's some other stuff? So I think, so those are all in game. Mm -hmm. right? So these are like, if I'm designing a adjudication mechanism or designing a scenario, those are all challenges you have about like scoping adjudication mechanisms, uh, especially if you're trying to design an unclassified game with military capabilities, that's a little fun. The next player level of challenges, right, are the players and the sponsors, right? Sponsors will, on one hand, we can, we can uh, I'll start and operate, I'm sure I'll miss many things. We'll say, put some cyber in there, right? Um, and that's 
very hard to do late stage in a game, right? So all of a sudden you have to start considering what the cyber components of a game are. Mm -hmm. um, and unless their game, unless they're prepared to deal with that as a serious, some, they will say add cyber to make it look more real, but not actually want cyber to be a serious part of the game, right? We want this game to really be about ships or we're going to stay with maybe ships. Uh, don't want to poke fun at other services. Uh, have to. Um, and sort of maritime combat operations. They might not actually care about the cyber component. They're telling you to include it. And that is a, a terrible thing to sort of have to, to push through. Uh, the other thing is you might include it and they say, well, that's not cyber. I was thinking of it's actually information operations that you're interested in. Oh, sure, that's um, right. Like, well, I wanted you to do like Twitter type stuff. Like, well, that's more of the information operations, larger category of, of operating information environment. That's a whole nother bag of, of terrible. And then uh, on the other side, you sort of have players who will either not understand cyber. It's fine, but worse yet, you may have players that really understand cyber and we'll get very much on the case of this isn't perfectly modeling my my domain. And I think that's a, a problem in general with SMEs as players when the game isn't about their subject. I think cyber might be a particularly keen example to, to some others. And then there's the adjudication back end on the back of that, which is cyber in the war game will always be a representation of whatever the SME thinks um, it is, which is its own challenge mm -hmm. i think that's worth more conversation does that sound no that's Please. all right that's all right I, mean, I think i think the one element you left out there um uh, so i mean just by way of sort of if someone says i want some cyber in the game which is fine it's fine mm -hmm. um you do want to get a sense of what is it that they mean by cyber like so how widely scoped are we talking cyber and then what is on what is available to be cybered so you can right. just you can just decide i want to hit only military assets in this game or you can say, all right, nope, um, if we're working like an army game, right? Sort of like this, you know, land territory and cities. And you can say, all right, well, you can do cyber play on this city because it's the city of contestation. These cities over here, maybe less so. You can ask them if they think cyber includes social media. You can ask them if they think cyber includes electromagnetic spectrum stuff, right? Um, because that's, you know, are we, are we talking, are we talking waveforms too? Or are we just talking, right? Can we? Can we talk satellite? And do you want to think about satellite? And if you don't want to think about satellites, then fine, right? I'm I'm cool with that. But you you do want to get from your from your sponsor, whoever wants the game to play. Like what kind, what flavors of cyber do you want in there? And you know, I think the I think we say the same thing every time, which is, man, keep it as simple as you can. So if it's not the case that the game needs active cyber play on information environment stuff then don't do it like don't start out with the simplest possible elements the simplest widgets um i mean one of the one of the easiest ways to think about cyber especially in a bigger operational game um is you can say all right we're gonna we're gonna sort of notionally represent this through um through delay and friction right so we're gonna say all right i don't know i don't have teams i don't have a cnmf team or i don't have a cyber command team here telling me how to how to get my effects into the game, but you can just sort of represent it notionally. You say, all right, look, um, we're trying to move into this sector. Uh, let's just, you know, if, if the adversary has launched cyber magic, um, then we'll delay, you know, we'll roll some dice and we'll delay by 10 minutes. We'll delay by one hour. We'll delay by a week. But, you know, so you make that assumption just, just in terms of will it delay? Another way to do it is to say, all right, well, we're not going to delay. We're going to do confusion, right? So now I'm not so sure anymore whether or not the data I'm getting you know, about the common operating pictures, right? And you can do that, right? But and you don't have to be highly technical or even know real effects, but you can represent it by, all right, well, um, here's half a message. Here's half an inject, enjoy, right? Uh, and see how that goes. Uh, and that, you know, but again, you need to decide what is it that you think you want the cyber to do? And then from there, you know, sort of play through the game. And if you don't like the way it turns out, start over and tweak your cyber again, right? Which you know, I know no, nobody has time for iterative games, but um, but there's no way for us to get better at this than to sort of say this is this is the way you do it. Yeah, I think that comes down to setting expectations of what cyber is going to look like within this game is very important. Mm -hmm. um, as the obfuscation piece that, uh, that you and I wrote sort of said, 
the ocean is the ocean in every game. You don't really need to understand the dynamics of what that is. Um, while in cyber, you sort of need to lay some parameters if you're going to have it in a game of how it's going to be represented. So players have realistic expectations. Friction is a really, really good one, right? Uh, especially a strategic or a sort of uh, high operational war game. Um, you don't want to get into the details of this computer network shut down. It doesn't help. It doesn't, it pulls players to a level of war fighting the game is not meant to be at. So you say, some net networks were compromised, resulting in six hour delay for the, you know, in, in cargo loading or whatever it might be. Um, or if you want to get into that, you know, accuracy is just generally reduced by a set percentage. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Of, of weapon systems. Um, and that's, it creates a standardized way for players to understand, all right, it'll take me longer to detect incoming aircraft, it'll take me longer to get, you know, Sons or adversaries will take longer for everything to work. Um, that's a great castle to be very proud. That's right. That's right. Should we talk a bit about how one talks to, how one works the education in the back end? What do you think the next logical step? Is? Let's see if there, anyone has any questions for us in the meantime. Um, let's 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 pull. Let's 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 see what the questions they have for us, and then we'll see what what um, where we can go with it. Yeah, sure. Um, and in fact, I've got a, a couple I scribbled down here as well. We've also got um, them starting to come in from the chat. So I'll, I'll, cool, I'll cool. get my I'll get mine out of the way and let uh, and let some folks get some more in the chat and then I'll, I'll turn it over to them. Um, so. I guess uh, sort of first thing is in. Whether whether you're talking, you know, the, the adjudication piece or what, you know, what sort of aspect of cyber you're doing. Do you have some success stories for how you've seen, uh, you know, cyber effects or cyber operations effectively represented really well or integrated really well into a gaming mechanic that, you know, you could you sort of share as good examples for us to strive for? And conversely, do you have any horror stories that you are willing to share that will not step on anybody's, you know, sponsor's toes or what have you, but, you know, <laughs> le lessons, uh, examples of what not to do or not how not to go about it? Do you have a top of mind one? Um, I have a little bit of, yeah, I have a little bit of both. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, they're not us, so I'm, I'm not in a personal capacity, uh, not through my official position, obviously. I think that uh, CNA's Merlin project is interesting. Um, that's all I'll say on that. So go CNA. Uh, but uh, in terms of, uh, there are some other successes, but I'll think if I can talk about them. But the, the big horror story that I've seen uh, was a, a miss, a, a error in scoping, right? This is a classic problem. We were looking for offensive cyber operations in a very traditional way, right? We wanted things to stop working. We wanted to brick things. We wanted cyber to play a, a outsized role in a cyber war game. Um, and we wanted to have a, a red cell do some of those things, right? It's always nice to have players dream up these sort of uh, wicked ways of breaking things. Um, the problem was that the red cell was very clever and they quickly realized that the way to achieve their objectives was not through the types of loud whiz bang cyber that we needed the game to have to, you know, make it a war game and not a wait and see game, uh, was not actually best for them to reach their strategic objectives. And so they did extremely subtle information warfare, information operations type things, manipulation, indirect effects, uh, uh, which was all brilliant, and it was not what we needed. Uh, and so, again, this was us not telling them more heavy handed. You are basically an extension of adjudication. We need you to be, be worse. Um, and, and this is, again, comes down to who do you bring into the game? What do you tell them to do? How do you parameterize the game? The players thought one thing, the red cell uh, players sort of thought one other thing. And it didn't expectations didn't line up, uh, which led to some friction. In the end, the back end, the game was fine, um, but it, it didn't. We didn't get the the war part of the game as much as I think we would have liked. Yeah, red was just um, really just waiting for blue to destroy itself. This is just so the hard part is some of this is just game, right? The game, it's like the game is, is a gameism, yeah. which is that. Um, I mean, Wait, we'll play. yeah, I mean, the problem is, right, so when, when we, 
manage your own expectations. So when you bring a bunch of war fighters into a game, they're going to do the thing that they've been, like, like everybody knows, like, right? We're going to, we're going to, you know, move the snags and then fly, you know, like get your sorties going. And you're like, everybody knows, right? Tip fit, right? It was, cause it's, cause you've been trained on that. Right. And so, and so of course they're going to do exactly what you think they're going to do. The, the interesting, I think, is like it's, Tom, it's either John Curry, who's a war gamer, or Tom Moad, who's also a war gamer, says, you know, one of the things that you need to be thinking about with cyber, when you put cyber into your games, is you have to be prepared to let the narrative um, play out in very unrealistic ways. And so you have to make a decision about whether or not you're going to allow what he, I think he calls them Star Trek moves. Right, which is like this is completely imaginary. It's all bullshit, right? And, and but nevertheless, right? They have done something that that maybe it's fully like could never happen, right? Like shut off all the electricity in the world for you know for twenty four hours. You're like, I'm, dude, that's not going to happen. But okay, allowing gameplay to pull through anyway teaches you not not about what's possible with cyber. Like that's not what you're looking at, right? What you're looking at is what are the other players doing as a result of that play, right? So one, they can sort of throw the towel and say it's not realistic, but two, yeah, but okay, so maybe it's not realistic, but what are you going to do about it, right? Are you gonna escalate? Um, are you gonna pull back all your force? Like, what are you gonna do? And so, so, so you have to manage your expectation because when something funky happens in a cyber, cyber either cyber in a game or a cyber war game, you have to be prepared for it to go, the wheels fall right off the game. And and that is and, and and the question is what is interesting about that? What about human behavior is different? What decisions got made differently um, than you would have expected? That that is that is a reason to look more closely. That is not that's not a that's not a game failure. That's not a game failure. You have to be prepared if you're going to put something funky in. Be prepared to funky things to come out, and then ask yourself what what drove that. And so I think I think some of this resistance to cyber is really about control. Right? Is that you? Well, you know, it didn't turn out what I expected to look like, and you're like, "Why well, are you wargaming then? Right. <laughs> why are you wargaming?" Yeah, I mean, it's it's the classic validity of adjudication, and I use validity in a very broad sense, right? But like, people are so concerned about the cyber adjudication being valid in mm -hmm. the sense that it is modeled on reality. Get over it. Uh, versus, does it is it incorporated in a way that meets the war game objectives, thus making the war game valid? Again, I'm not using it in a social science sense, but like... no, so so think about it this way, right? So how many times have you been in a war game where where all this all the you know all the forces are pre-positioned weirdly, like right at the edge of like a landmass? And you're like, well, that's not realistic, right? Like, why would an adversary like wake up one morning and like your entire navy's just off the coast? You're like, that's garbage, right? But nobody questions that, like, okay, now play. And you're like, okay, okay, right? So at some level. There's a lot of there's a lot of just sort of crap, right? That we throw into games to start them up, and you you know, so we just don't question them because we've seen them so often. And so I don't, I, you know, so I'm just saying, you know, I'm not saying we don't need more rigor or better data or, or you know whatever, but if you're just trying to figure out what does the cyber stuff do in terms of how command makes decisions or how you move forces, like just be prepared for funky. That's all. And we have other questions, so we should let them know. Yeah. Other questions. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm gonna hold uh, hold mine um, off because we are getting a bunch coming in the chat. So I'm gonna start going through those. Um, first, we had a question from Mr. Dave Sanye. Dave, are you able to ask directly, um, or uh, if you can type in the? Yes, I, I can, and I think they've actually addressed a lot of it. But uh, I, dealing with a lot of these uh, war fighters, you know, they're very comfortable with uh, electronic warfare. You know, as far as jamming, spoofing, and that's kind of how they, you know, seem to seem uh, see cyber. Um, where is the dividing line between just you know the traditional electronic warfare that they're they're used to and and cyber operations? I mean, and how do we kind of get them to think outside of you know what they're used to dealing with on EW? Over. Well, you hit on, I would say, one of my my bugbears, which is this. Cyber is part of this larger information environment, right? Operating information. And where the line between cyber and these other things is, is very tricky, right? Because ultimately, 
you have a machine that you are trying to manipulate in some way. You're trying to make it produce an output that is not what it's intended to, to do. You're trying to shape uh, the person using its reality by manipulating their machine. Um, and so that's oftentimes, and that's only one way cyber can be used, right? And this is where it gets tricky because cyber can do all their kinds of crazy things. Well, not that crazy, but, um, and so in many ways, you'll see when players use cyber in war games, they're actually trying to replicate EW style effects. Oftentimes, well, we want to launch an air raid and we want their IADs not to work. Well, the EW equivalent is we want to jam their ability to detect our incoming aircraft or their, you know, or the uh, ground to air attack response, right? It's trying to produce very similar effects and they're just trying to use a different avenue to do that. And I think for the average warfighter who, right, that is their concern, that is what they're trying to do, that's, Fine. Right. So I have a question. I have a question. Just a quick follow up question, David. Is this a? Are you trying to get them to, to, um, to learn a little bit more about all the different ways in which cyber effects can express? I I, I believe so. The things that I've okay. seen some of these in these electronic war games, you know, like Exada, you know, that I don't know if you're familiar with it. But, uh, you know, it shows all the network nodes and communications and oh, digital okay. twins and things like that and the degradation, you know, of one node and how it's going to affect your operations and all that. But, uh, you know, on a deeper level, I don't know if there's a lot of understanding, you know, beyond that. You know, they know about the jammers and things yeah. like that. But what are these other things that can cause those kinds of problems that a uh, commander might have to deal with? I, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it does. Um, I mean, I think so. Uh, I'm gonna gonna point to other people who have tried to build into this space. And so um, Ben Leitzel, along with his team, out of the Army War College, um, we're interdisciplinary, right? Uh, out, of, out of the Army War College, has put together um, a pretty reasonable um, board game. Yeah. So first of all. I, I have a I have a, an allergic response to um, to uh, uh, big screens with lots of sort of pew pew going on. Uh, in part because it you know I, we've been playing. I've been thinking about hackers and cyberspace and networks and architecture for a long time, and I still look at those and it makes no sense. And so I'm not. It's not clear to me why anybody else would look at those and have it make sense. And so. Um, I think that I think just thinking about it, not in terms of sort of electronic representation, which I think is often overwhelming and doesn't 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 teach you anything in particular. Um, so Ben's game, and I, sorry, there are other there are other designers to the game. I apologize, I forget their names. But anyway, so this game of the armor, it's, it's just cards, right? And you've got you've got a DDoS attack, and you've got a phishing scheme, and you've got all these different ways. And you learn how to leverage them to compromise your adversary, right? So, um, you know, we often in the Navy, we worry about uh, compromise at, in the port, right? Which is a big danger point because it's, you know, everybody's, everyone's somewhere, you know, most of your guys are somewhere between the age of 18 and like 35 and, you know, they want to go and like turn on their phones. And, and so thinking about it those ways, right? So playing through that scenario gets people thinking about um, not just like network effects, right? But, um, but about like what are my own personal actions? How would I how would I execute in this space to compromise an adversary? Um, not using it, you know, not thinking of it as a sort of an old military perspective, but sort of what can I do individually or what can I dream up? And then once you have that footing about like what can I do or how do I compromise my team by doing stuff? And this is not the sort of like cyber challenge with Tina and what's his face, but um you know, once you start thinking about it in those terms, then you can sort of move forward and say, all right, so that's, you know, we understand it at an individual level. Now let's, now let's, let's lift it up a little bit. And now let's talk about, um, you know, if, you know, especially if you're in a classified space, you know, sort of now let's talk about um, how an operation might get done. Right. And, and often like, you don't necessarily need a game to do this right, but there are teams of national mission force teams or what they're called um, COIPIs. Um, um, which are sort of policy guys, but um, there's all sorts of different cyber teams out there that you can sort of invite into the classroom and say, all right, walk me from, from A to Z, walk me through an op, show me, you know, t tell me about stuff. Um, and if you're working with your own folks and you, you know, and you've got, you know, you've got, you don't need more than secret. 
I can't imagine. Um, you can walk through it, or you can do like I do, which is I go and I talk to hackers and I say, start me from zero to all the way through. Um, and they'll talk you through it and you're like, oh, okay, I see how that works. And then you, then you say, now that you understand that perspective, now that you've read a couple of cases of how it gets done, now let's play this game. And see if you get variation and that they start getting out of the sort of spoofing jamming headset and start thinking about again, if this is only if you want people to think about these things, like, how do I compromise an adversary's unit, you know, cohesion, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's something you want to teach. Sometimes I worry about it. We get too clever by half, but yeah, I mean, it is interesting because essentially what you're saying is players have gotten used to a particular abstraction of a digital environment. That's right. Uh, and now how do you create a new? The abstraction of a new digital environment um, that will look pretty similar. I network sort of maps or cyber things, as we discussed earlier, unless they're trying to attack a very, unless you're playing a game where it's like they're attacking a single ship, and then you can generate some sort of network map that ship and sort of like, oh no, they've attacked this component of the ship, which is entering this effect across the physical operations of it. Uh, that's one thing. Um, but if you move beyond a very tight constraint, you can't network too much um, without a tremendous effort. The people who get closest to doing that are there some high level games that are played with actual uh, run out of OSD policy cyber. They do some pretty high advanced stuff, but they have the actual people who do the defending and attacking bring their actual network maps to do actual gameplay. That is a so close to being a simulation that I start to wonder if it's a war game anymore. Um, so long story short, if players understand what is actually happening through a larger education about cyber, as Nina said, the network maps may they may understand that network maps don't actually help them. They don't. They don't. They don't. I don't think they don't. I've never yet met anybody who was like, "Wow, <laughs> well, this <laughs> network map's really working for me." Um, but um, yeah, it's just try and right size that dragon, right? Get people familiar with the usual attack and defense capabilities, and but you know, yeah. getting all the way to the kind of physical representation of networks. So. It's not even how real defenders do it, so yeah. I don't know. I think it's just very shiny. It's very shiny, and if you want to ooh ah it, then yes, show the pew pew map. But uh, <laughs> never met anyone actually use the pew pew map before. Uh, and, and I've never seen a hacker be like, "Wow, here's my pew pew map!" Right? So um, they're looking at you know they're looking at log systems. They're looking at boring code, right? They're not looking at it. So I don't I don't know you know like if it's it's exciting for like a second, then it's stop doing it. Yeah, you're not gonna learn anything from it. The official hashtag for this talk, by the way, is pew pew map. Uh, at us and <laughs> hashtag pew pew map. Uh, sorry, sorry. Next question. I apologize. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And I've uh, I've written down pew pew map. That's going into my lexicon here oh, that I'm gonna yeah, use in sure. my, uh, from now on. So next question we have is from uh, Chad Miners at MIT. Looks like Chad, are you able to ask your question directly? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I have some experience with um, both uh, some forms of war games, but more particularly uh, military exercise, and I know that they differ. But what I was more common, uh, commonly interested in is uh, what what do the game common game objects start out as with the war games? Because it would seem that um, if your game board is designed to answer one particular type of questions, but um, adding cyber to it just doesn't answer those questions. You, you're you're just sort of playing the wrong game for the wrong objectives. I, I mean, I'll just very quickly and then take from there. There's a great thing we talked about, around, which is games with cyber and games about cyber. It's a super dirty dichotomy, but one is basically it's a war game like any other war game. You got your ships, you got your airplanes, you got whoever the components are, and then cyber is just one of the other things. And then you have games that are like asking questions about cyber and the objective is cyber related. Um, and I think that's really, you know, if it's cyber with cyber, then it's sort of like, you know, give more, more, no more time or energy to it than you would to like figuring out any of the other aspect of it. <laughs> if it's a game about cyber, the objectives there can be pretty wild, um, right? Depending on what you're trying to get at, it can be sort of like, what is the pain threshold in cyberspace before they activate or use these types of resources? Is cyberspace escalatory? Do cyber attacks lead to people using kinetic responses? Those are some questions you might see. And what is that threshold, right? Um, I think, you know, people might start using kinetic attacks if you use cyber to like open all the floodgates on something, which is ridiculous and would probably never happen. 
but let's say. Um, so yeah, anyway, those are some questions uh, I may have I've seen sort of cyber wargaming. Congratulations, Vic. Yeah, I, I mean, so the objectives, um, the most common objectives, I mean, the problem is we're, we're sort of framed by the space we're in. So, so uh, you know, the Naval War College does a lot of strategic and operational wargaming. So the questions are often strategic and operational. Um, when we're lucky, they're clear. Um, and for, for those who've been following along on, on, the, on all the wargaming, um, all the wargaming broadcasts, if you haven't heard this a million times already, um, you'll hear it going forward, which is <clears throat> people often want a war game, but they don't actually know why they want a war game. Um, and so then what happens is you have to design something that is a war game that they, you don't, it has no, no explicit purpose or objective. And then you have to sort of work it out of them. Like, well, what could some potential objectives or purposes be? And so I think, so again, just to speak to the point. I don't know. I don't know yet whether we are having trouble cyber wargaming, or if we're just having another version of this of the problem that happens with wargaming perennially, which is I want a war game. What are we doing this for? And so, um, and so, you know, game failure or failure to reach a game objective, in part, is because people are saying I want cyber in a game, and you're like, but I don't know what you, what is it. What's the question? Um, and so then, you know, why can't we get good answers about cyber? And you're like, well, I don't know. Probably because you got you know. The, the question there's no or there's no question yeah. right there's no questions i just want to put cyber in a game and and I, look i'm all about like let's just see how this plays out um but that's you know that's hardly a it's hardly an analytic enterprise and it's certainly a terrible teaching objective so um so i don't know what we're doing um so i i just don't know how much of this is i don't know how much of this concern is really just part of wargaming in general and it's just been laid like brutally bare by the fact that you know that that cyber is just this kind of weird, funky animal that kind of moves through these spaces in ways that we're like, oh, you know, we're all vulnerable in these funky ways, um, and you know, your 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 cell phone is is cheating on you, so you know, it's fine. No click, no click. Oh, update. By the way, if you have an Apple iPhone, you haven't updated, please do so now because it's really just please update your iPhone. Um, and that's from last last week's zero day. Anyway, last week's zero day exploit. Um, uh, Okay. Um, also, there's a person on the screen. I just have to point this out. Whose name is Robert O'Day and I was wondering if that was their actual last name or if they were trying to be funny because it's cyber war gaming and it's a zero day or an O day exploit. So that was my curiosity. You can answer that later. I was wondering. I was curious. Be a great hacker. I know. I know. Right. Anyway. Um, okay. Other questions. Yes, and I, I, uh. I believe uh, that is his actual name. We've seen him on the audience oh, list before. So great. Um, so great. Gosh. Best last name. It is. Um, good. So, all right. Next question uh, is from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Curtis Kobeck. He's our operations and outreach officer here at the Kulak Center. And, sir, if you want to ask it directly, um, go ahead. Uh, sure thing. You guys kind of already answered it, um, but as a training and teaching tool, right, are there games out there that, that you've seen people use that, that we can tell the instructors like, hey, you should try this game, like specifically that one you were talking about, Army War College, the board game or card game, whatever it was, that game or others to try and help walk people through what uh, the conceptually what this may be able to do and help get them comfortable with what this is. So, so once we're done here, we'll, um, we'll send along information about, um, I think we're, we're still waiting for the, we, so the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute has, um, Done a horrible thing, and we decided we wanted to do an edited volume on and solicit people to tell us about the war games they've, their cyber war games that they've created. So we have a we have this compendium of different games that have been developed, largely across PME. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so and so as soon as you know, one we're happy to offline and not for distro share the contacts of the people who have those games ready on the shelf and want to play them um, there. We there's all different kinds of objectives. We, we, we divide the game roughly into um, half research analytics and then half teaching and learning fully admitting that most of the games could be played both ways. And so, um, so we were more than I'm more than happy to just offline for any of you want to sort of like, I'm looking for a game that looks like this. Um, we have seen. Tons of them, and so we're happy to we're happy to share that. There's, there's also Perfect. some interesting ones that are commercial off the shelf that we can try to scrounge up. One that comes to name we were talking about games earlier that I forgot was NDU. 
anticipated game, Pinnacle Protagonist, that was pretty good. Um, uh, Isn't the one, the electronic one? Yeah, it's the, um, it's the uh, uh, Matrix game. So, right? You know what? Actually, the, you're, you're pointing out something that we should probably have done a long time ago, which is just generate a list of all the Cyber War games to that we know. Yeah, yeah, derp. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll get on that. We'll, we'll push that out to you guys. Um, We'll do top of mind draft version, and then it, then it, but you know the only obligation being that if we push that list that we're like this is what we know so far. If you know of something that you're like, well, I I played that even if it sucked, like you should put it on the list so that we all have a sort of a reasonable list of different cyber games that are out there and kind of a brief summary of like what is it it does. Yeah. It's, yeah, oops, yeah, we should probably do that. So you can tweet your recommendations at us using hashtag oh. pew pew map. <laughs> Well played. Well played. Okay, that's right. That's right. Um, yes, yeah, so there. Happy to share. Always happy to share. And so again, like obviously, there's a lot of stuff that we can't talk about. Um, but you know, interpersonally, if you come on up, or I'm down in DC, so if you want me to come down to Quantico and talk it through, easy day. I you know, I can I can jump in the car. So easy. Yeah, that'd be great because here in MCU, right, we we talk higher level stuff, but. Coming, uh, my last place was was a training command. So working with grunts to try and help get them understand this, anything sure. would be very beneficial because a lot of them really struggled with this. So interesting. Yeah. Um, there's a, a dissertation actually by Andreas Hagman, uh, who wrote about games for education and games for fun. Mm -hmm. The dissertation is on it. He designed a game. It talks a lot about sort of what makes a game good for education and for or for fun. That might be a helpful resource for for educators as well. Just putting his name out there yeah and so um but that's a real problem signing us up for work we we have no time to do um which is what i'm gonna do right now oh, that's good yeah um uh if you haven't noticed already it's sort of like ben and i are effectively work spouses right sort of like we just spend all of our time um we have we have real partners but like work spouse um we should probably put together a just a quick a quick powerpoint prezzo on like Cyber cyber war gaming for teaching and learning and just oh, yeah. and just put just put it just put all the resources that we know of and kind of ways to frame that down. Yeah. Um, we can do that. It'll be the games and be some lightning bolts, we'll some satellites, some aircraft lines going between them all. And and of course a good pew pew map. That's because... right. Gotta have the pew pew map, yes. <laughs> yes. How does this become our brand? No, no, I'm a little embarrassed. Oh, yeah. So We're in so much trouble right now. All right, other people, other questions? Yeah, great. No, and uh, you know, I have no problem asking people to add to their workload for for work that they don't have time to do already. It's one of my favorite things to do to Sebastian, actually. Um, all right, next question we had is uh, from Vishalji Oderda. O Odedra, um, are you able to ask your question directly? Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Nina. I just got this very short question. Um, I put it through as a as a message. It's um, what it is is. When a uh, question has anyone modeled using cyber for supporting blue for resiliency and team cohesion? Over. I missed the set part. Has anyone modeled cyber? Could you repeat the last part? I'll see if it's in the, um, yeah. see if it's, it's in the, the it's in the chat as well. Oh, I'm cyber. sorry. It's not, it was sent to me. Um, has anyone modeled using cyber for supporting blue force resiliency and team cohesion? Oh, oh, team cohesion. Interesting. Uh, so blue force resiliency. Um, and you mean for non cyber, like, so non cyber teams, so not so non cyber defenders, just regular, def you mean for non cyber defenders, just regular yeah. forces? Yeah, so uh, essentially to support the, the psychological model of the operational co concept. So you want your team to, to be happy, to be upbeat, to be able to operate yeah. at the level and using cyber to, to support that team in, in, in a Almost in an inverse manner. So you're, yeah, you're yeah. guiding people on to things that they want to research. You're you're supporting people in their their their, their career and etc. I first off love that question. Again, it gets into this cyber is part of the larger information environment, and it generates effects beyond just the technical ones in terms of morale. Um, having said that, um, I can think of some things about IT friction in the workplace, right? Some uh, organization, industrial organizational studies, right? About mm -hmm. uh, uh, team cohesion in terms of using like uh, Teams or Zoom, um, the ability of, there's some good work on like how communications mediums affect uh, team cohesion in terms of like if latency on email or phone goes down, <laughs> teams more or less cohesive. Um, 
our day-to-day -day lives is a study on that, I think. But I can't think of anything explicit specifically how can cyber attacks be used to target morale and what are the effects of that? And how do you and how does and and and, and, and place them as the, as place the, def, the the blue team as the defender, right? Sort of developing developing plans yeah. and strategies to deal with. So good news, uh, we have not. Uh, better news, please. We invite you to make a game um, that that uh, that this is the case. I have to say that. Um, yeah, for as far as morale and cohesion and sort of blue team defenders, I don't, you know, there's you're, you're going to be on, you're going to have to develop it. And I, and I, there's probably, so the, the trick about war games is that is or in games in general is that they, there's like archetypes. There's like yeah. sort of ideal types, like, you know, sort of um, battleship is like, you can, you can take battleship skin it of the of the ships and play a whole other version of it and so you want to think really what's the vehicle right or is it is it shoots and ladders is it monopoly done a different way um so you want to think about it that way i think a good space to look at this is the way hackers do or just blue blue team defenders in general do um so in the industry in cybersecurity firm industry how do blue team defenders deal with the problem because they because burnout's a serious issue in the field and so i'll have a, i'll have a look around and see what kinds of games they play cybersecurity defense firms um because they have they have very serious morale and burnout issues and i'm i'm i'd be surprised if they weren't if they weren't developing yeah. defend uh, games to sort of Figure out how to do it better, but right. but in terms of what we've seen on the military, I've not I've never seen such a thing, and it's probably a really smart thing to build. Great, and now uh, at the risk of sort of self promotion for the Krelak Center here, I will say not in the gaming sense, but in sort of the um, the the thicken or you know speculative writing sense, some of our products have explored sort of in prose how you could use cyber potentially for those types of effects that, you know, very human effects. I'm not just knocking out your computer. I'm putting something on your computer that makes you sad or angry that, um, yeah. that causes so Twitter, you to just Twitter. all of Twitter. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I may throw that into, into the notes here, but I don't want to get, get too far off track from the gaming side. Cause on the gaming side, we have not done that, but we, we have had people write about it and think about it. I love it. You, yeah. I, I love it. I would love to see people do work on it. The cyberbullying literature might be something to pull from. That's right. That's right. Honestly. That's right. Yeah. A lot of yeah, stuff so for that. There, there are some things we we I I can share directly um, with the guests if you wanna um, if you wanna email me and then to Definitely. Dr. Collars, um, Professor Shecker, if you want me to send you some of that stuff, I can do that separately as well. Oh, please, Absolutely. please. If there's a, there's a we have a um, a VCOP, a virtual community of practice. Um, and so we're always happy to either add new resources to it or take whatever resources we've had and, and share them around. This is, yeah. it is a problem, uh, with, 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 I think just being in the DOD in general, um, the sharing just doesn't happen quite the same way it does in academia. Cause we don't have time and energy to do exactly what you guys are trying to do here. Right. Which is let's talk about what we work on. Otherwise we're just going to keep continuing on in our silos. And so it's just a, you know, just, just a, just a, I'm, you know, then my way of saying thanks for, for putting this together because we just don't do enough of it. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's part of why we're here. Awesome. Um, okay, one more question again from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kobeck, and then I'll, I'll put out a last call to the audience for any final questions, and then we'll take it. Uh, we'll wrap it up here. So, sir, if you want to ask your follow-on question. All right, it's it's kind of tangential to the topic here today, so let me know if, if it's beyond what you'd like to talk about. But uh, in my experience, uh, a lot of people wish away the capability of cyber uh, using the argument that, wow, we won't have the, the authority to do that or permissions, right? That's going to be a, at the national level. So that it's like, it's not even really worth us really thinking about too much. In my opinion, uh, though, as technology becomes more right diffusive and more capable and AI enables less uh, specialized people to employ maybe some of these, uh, some of these effects, I think it's going to get pushed down. But I'm kind of curious, do you guys have a sense uh, that uh, whether or not this will get pushed down to the tactical and operational level so that the the smaller units will be able to use some of these cyber effects in the future. Um, I'll start with just one opening uh, comment, which is that the it's not our problem is the ubiquitous cyber response. It's the <laughs> private sector. The private sector has that same problem, right, which is the CEO, and the, the, the CCO doesn't want to deal with the cybersecurity stuff. That's the, the CISO and 
know, the CIO's problem. God, keep it off my desk. Um, and so it is a natural response for, for managers everywhere. Like it's kind of complicated. It feels complicated. It feels strange. And I would say in a really, you know, uh, do your DOD training way, you know, cyber hygiene is all of our responsibilities. Uh, update your phones. But well, well played. I, I think, I think that, I think that, um, you know, sort of trying to predict, trying to read this sort of the crystal ball of authorities is not only painful, but boring, uh, but um, the, the problem, even, even if, even if those authorities never appear, right, if, if the tactical level or the, you know, the, everybody else is going to be playing at the tactical level. Like, what, what makes you think that everybody else is not going to be playing at the tactical level? I, I spend all of my time in an ocean of people who only play at the tactical level and do it, you know, and I only play with the, the white hats, but the, but, you know, they're, they are out there doing adversarial degradation. They are out there doing so, 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 so you're hamstringing your own people. If they have no idea how it's happening, you're hamstringing their capacity to even just interrupt you know, for lack of a better phrase, the kill chain, right? So it's not enough to say, well, we're never going to have those authorities. You still have to know how it, how it comes together. You still have to know how to think how the adversary thinks. And it's also the case that everybody else out there, right. to include state-sponsored actors, are doing at the tactical level. So not knowing is is no excuse. Now, we hope you know. Hopefully, you know, we don't push you know corrosive information operations, you know, uh, uh, psyops all the way down to the edge, right? Like, I think it's probably a terrible <laughs> idea, bad for democracy, but not understanding it's dumb, right? Like you have to understand it. And so I think, I think you're just doing yourself a disservice if you want to wave it away. Yeah, I get it. You guys are busy. You have a lot of training cycles. I get it. Right. But that's not like, yeah. it's not an excuse. You still have to learn. You still have to sort of know roughly how it works. Um, you know, worst case scenario, this is never, no one likes when I say this, send them all to Las Vegas, make them play a few games at DEF CON, it'll be fine, they'll figure it out, right? And so um, I know, you know everybody wants to send- You should send all the enlisted. You send all our enlisted to Las Vegas, what could go around? Um, <laughs> You'll get no objection to that. Sorry, <laughs> morale goes up. Speaking of, yeah, using cyber to improve morale. There's a, building sort of off of that, there's a model or concept rather that Naval Academy, oh, yeah. uh, which is the all some that every naval officer needs to know the basics of cyberspace and cyberspace operations the same way that they understand any of the joint type things, right? And even more than we do now in our like JPME uh, uh, requirements um, to understand how operations are put together, the basics of cybersecurity. So that becomes one of those back pocket skills. Uh, in the same way that uh, I referenced those two philosophy classes I once took endlessly. Um, but then you move up to some level, and that's those are the people who deal with the machinery that really sure. is cyber sensitive. They need to really understand a little bit more about how their systems are integrated and the vulnerabilities that exist there, yada, yada, yada. And then you have the few, which are the cyber operators who really need to know not just the basics of protecting and the, what could go wrong, but like how to break it. The, hack, the hackers and training type stuff. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting to get the basic school to actually offer basic cyber exposure for our young officers. That's an interesting concept. I'm, so, I'm sad you're not seeing that. And, and um, I think one of the things that I think I'm hoping that we see come out um, in the next rounds of the OpMap is that we're looking at we're looking at sort of introducing good baseline cyber operational education, not just cyber education, but cyber operational education. So, so, so for instance, sort of like, um, you know, oh, you know, do I have my, my satchel over here, 60 or 70 zero day exploits that I can just launch it? No, nobody has that. That's stupid. Right. And, but, but why would a, why would a person know that unless you thought, unless you understood basically how exploits work, unless you understood roughly what, it, you know, how does one string together a whole bunch of, um, uh, information and cyber efforts to create an effect, right? Knowing that, right? I think again, just under the DEF CON, but you know, yeah. giving that basic information, why why is it we can't just cyber everything, right? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can I can teach you that, right? Yeah. Why can't we just cyber it this morning? We can't even get the air conditioning on this morning. So let's just Yeah, you know, the flux capacitor was busted. That's right. Our turbo encabulator wasn't working. 
These are both fake um, things, by the way. Anyway. It's probably on someone's pew pew map that was specifically targeted. That's why. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, it's going to be a sticker next yeah. year. I know it. it uh, okay. Right. Anyway, right. sorry. We, we, we do go on. Uh, 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 go ahead. No, oh, great. Um, that is actually the last question in the chat and pretty much covered all the things that I, I had scribbled on my sheets here, so I won't dwell on any of that. Um, so really, I, I'll turn it back to you if you have any final uh, closing comments or thoughts you'd like to share um, or other resources that you could direct people to here in the last couple of minutes. Um, cyber is, is fun. Wargaming is fun. Cyber wargaming is even more fun. People should do it. I, uh, my, uh, yes. what? Um, for those of you who are in, if you're going to, if you're going to be in Quantico through January, um, there is a, there is an annual East coast hacker, th hacker con called schmoo con S H M O O schmoo con is for conference or convention really, but schmoo con will be at the end of January. And so, um, if you're looking for ways to play with cyber. Um, and, and to help people understand a little bit more about how to get playful with cyber, because because that's one thing the cyber is, is just really fun. Um, definitely find a way to get to ShmooCon. Um, I think the admission fee is something like $85 or something. Um, it's limited, but, um, but hit me up if you're trying to go, because I usually go every year and I can sort of give you, I can, I can, I can Sherpa your way through your first hacker convention. You'll be great. Um, but it's a great, it's a great place to learn and, and then to help teach other people. So that's, that's my resource. I go to hacker cons. That's where my resource comes from. The more serious way, I think. In terms of the cyber wargaming problem set, I think. Not being intimidated by the concept of cyber and what cyber is. And sort of experimenting and understanding what mm -hmm. you're trying. If you understand what you're trying to accomplish, you understand the objective of why you're running this war game. The cyber component should not be the thing that deters you from doing it. Shouldn't. Um, I think that uh, wargaming is in general is a bit of a guild system, and cyber is even more so. Right? <laughs> cyber is a, feels like a closed community, um, and I think in both senses, there might be some truth to the extreme levels, but for the most part, being interested, being curious, and going out and doing it uh, is the best way to sort of get into that into that That's space true. That's true. um and as you can sort of see uh you and i we're pretty chatty uh, hit us up helpful yeah. uh people um and so I, I think that we're trying to model that behavior in this cyber war gaming space so go forth give it a shot uh and uh, we're here for you hit yeah. us up we got email yep yeah all right <clears throat> great um Thank you. We will. And I will, uh, um, if we did not sort of do it at the outset, you know, I, if, as you were both in the NCR or down in the Quantico area, doors are open and I, uh, Dr. Callers, I know for you, uh, you should have been on the email where I sent out, we have a non-resident fellow cubicle for all of you non-resident fellows to come and, uh -huh. and, uh, and hang your hat on your visits down here. Heck yeah. Um, yeah. We'll so, do. We'll do. But uh, no, I agree. So I, uh, I think, that's all we have from our end. Um, to both of you, thank you very much for your time today. Um, so glad we were able to get you on to continue our theme of our theme of wargaming, certainly, but cyber is definitely a subcategory of that theme that we at the Cree Lake Center have had questions thrown our way about. We don't really have great answers, so we were glad to get you on to help us find some of those answers. Always, always happy to make the connection. So Pleasure. thanks for tuning in, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. And yeah, thank you to the audience for joining us again today for another broadcast. So next week, we will be wrapping up our focus on wargaming on the series with Sebastian Bay, who is another one of our non-resident fellows. And Super he is one whose homegrown war game, FMF Indopaycom, is having a big impact both here in the PME world that we kind of operate in, but it's also going out across the operating forces, both Marine Corps and other services. And it's great to be able to see that, uh, getting the different service perspectives around the same table to all learn from each other. So he will be on next week to talk about how he and his team have designed the game um, and executed it and gotten in front of these different audiences. And we hope you can join us all then. Thank you very much. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.